I have never, I've, I've been to Canada many, many times. Um, actually, I was born in the UK. Uh, normal, usually to come and see the uh, natural wildernesses you have camping. Uh, but I took on this uh, responsibility at Baycrest and I'm enjoying living in, in Toronto. I'm actually living in the assisted living facility associated with Baycrest. So I'm really um, pleased to be getting a, a very broad Canadian experience for the next year or so. And particularly to see, now this is a memory test, Anne-Marie, Carl, uh, uh, Mary Beth, um, and Brenda here. Um, because I'm gonna start my presentation actually by uh, telling you a little bit about some of my friends who are living with um, dementia. Because I do think this is January, this is Alzheimer's Awareness Month. But you know, awareness is a very interesting word, isn't it? Because awareness changes, and our understanding of Alzheimer's disease and dementia are changing, in my opinion, because of the work here at Merip and, uh, and elsewhere. And so I, I really celebrate your work, and I'm, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, <clears throat> this is um, the uh, month in which we're trying to not only uh, bring awareness, but also counteract this stigma. The Alzheimer's Society of Canada and Alzheimer's Disease International have campaigns to try to have us think differently and deeply about this, these words that we use. And I acknowledge uh, uh, Sherry and Gail and others and, uh, that uh, have been doing a lot of work in this area uh, themselves. Uh, so the, here we are. This is the, the World Alzheimer's uh, uh, Overcoming the Stigma of Dementia, and, and this is the Alzheimer's Society of Canada saying, let's think differently. I have to say, the Alzheimer's Association of the United States has this rather awkward uh, role that it plays. It wants us to reduce stigma. Meanwhile, it's telling us that people are suffering and dying and becoming zombies as a result of uh, this process. Uh, and there's one uh, event like that happening every 68 seconds. So the trouble is in this field that some of our major proponents of, uh, of, of thinking about Alzheimer's disease actually are stuck and actually I think do, do uh, play a certain amount of role themselves in creating the stigma that they say we ought ourselves not to be uh, dealing with or addressing differently. I entered um, the space of stigma, if you will, through my own work as a photographer and the work of Kathy Greenblatt who wrote uh, a book called Alive with Alzheimer's, which was all photographs of folks, people, enjoying life who just happened to have uh, a dementia and, and often Alzheimer's. And we actually wrote a review of this book and we said, yes, it is wonderful that we cele celebrate the vitality of people when they have these labels, but if they didn't have the label with such a stigma, maybe they would actually be even more alive. Maybe the label Alzheimer's itself is what is distracting in part from their abilities to, to, to live their lives as fully as they would. <clears throat> um, so uh, Kathy came and photographed some of my patients, and uh, this is Kathy at Baycrest photographing some of their folks. Um, and, and so this whole notion that relationships uh, that can be captured through photography are a part of the the, uh, the, what we want to uh, foster. Um, some of you uh, might know uh, Richard Taylor, who's a friend of mine. He blogs on our site, The Myth of Alzheimer's. Um, Richard uh, has uh, been creating a variety of responses. He's, he's really a thorn in the side of the Alzheimer's Society. Uh, I keep calling it, in, in the United States, it's the Alzheimer's Association, because he's saying, uh, don't give me these words uh, of false hope uh, associated with medical fixes all the time. We've got to focus on the provision of care now and in the future for people affected by these conditions. Um, Richard is um, one of my, uh, my, my friends and colleagues in that endeavor. This is from the Alzheimer's Disease International Meeting in London. Um, I don't know if Lynn McDonald was here. I can't quite see everybody in the front row, but Canada has been represented in this process. This is Peter Ashley from the UK. There's Richard. Um, th this is a, uh, an organization called DASNI, Dementia Advocacy Support Network International. This is a group of people that are banded together, started, I believe, in Australia with Christine Bryden to try to bring attention not just to the important uh, uh, role of caregivers, but the important role of people with this label in, in this space as well. So uh, this is just um, Peter Ashley um, almost celebrates his, the word dementia, and he uh, has a Lewy body dementia. Um, 
Anne Basting, who does a lot of work in theater, and I uh, created a, uh, a, D a DVD called Talk Back, Move Forward on the 100th anniversary of Alzheimer's disease a few years, and Anne is a professor of theater arts. And uh, in this uh, multimedia program that we did, uh, we talked about the importance of words and uh, used a combination of black and white photographs and black and white words, just as you saw in that exhibit outside. For those of you that haven't seen the exhibits, be sure to look at them before you go. These words that, um, that are full of uh, this ambivalence we have about the fears and hopes associated with this condition. I was uh, featured and said on that DVD that perhaps I uh, wanted to experience or even had an element of dementia. Uh, it's a very kind of controversial statement for a neurologist to say that, but I think we all have to have a certain amount of humility about our abilities as human beings to think deeply about the issues that face us as a species. We're not doing so well with our activities of daily living if you look at global climate change. And I am not in any way suggesting that um, th we all uh, deserve a clinical label. Perhaps nobody deserves a clinical label. We'll talk about that in a minute, or at least the word dementia. But to be a little bit more humble about what we all think and know about the world around us, I think, is an important part of I seem to be bouncing here. I'll try to move more slowly. That's difficult for me. I was diagnosed as hyperactivity a long time ago. <laughs> um, and even on January 17th, somebody sent me a link. Uh-oh, this is the, uh, and more in the middle. Well, this is, but well, then I'm going to have to go and turn this. All right, so while they're figuring out how to orchestrate me, uh, that was pretty easy, Sherry. <laughs> The only thing I can say in my defense is, this is a Blackberry. <laughs> I, I, Carl, I think they are. I'm looking forward to the, the Blackberry 10. Um, all right, now that they've got me to behave properly, we can get started. So I, ha I am a, a, an MD, PhD. I'm interested in words. I studied psycholinguistics, which is the study of what words mean, how words relate to each other, and um, how words change over time. And words, of course, are important to us not just because they're a single word, but because they are parts of stories. So as Sherry mentioned, I'm interested in narrative. I'm interested in how words are connected and how words change over time. And Alzheimer's and dementia are words that have changed over time and will continue to change. Uh, I wanted to start with this area of aging um, because aging is changing. Aging has changed throughout history as a concept, and particularly because of the baby boomers, the concept of aging is changing. And it is an illustration of the kinds of social forces at work that are changing this concept, and it is it, under this concept that we need to consider the words like dementia and Alzheimer's. So experts, be careful of them, they're not quite as expert as they, know, they think they are, have invented words like successful aging and productive aging. And I have a certain um, skepticism about this notion that uh, a neuroskepticism that the world can be fully understand by making everything just a brain problem. Um, you know, there's neuropolitics and there's neuroeconomics and there's neurotheology. There are neuro everything in the world today. And as a neurologist, I can tell you that um, it, it's a little bit of a concern. So I'm going to look talk first about the aging words and then about the diagnostic words, Alzheimer's and, all, and uh, dementia. So there are a whole lot of concepts. In fact, through history, and this is a history book written by a friend of mine, the journey of age has changed. The role of older people in society has evolved and will continue to evolve. 
We got started a little bit late, so I'm going to look at Sherry, who looks concerned already, about um, to give me a signal at five minutes, okay, if you can do that, because we can try to compress. Oh, good grief. <laughs> That is not because I have five minutes left. That is because <laughs> Sherry is demonstrating the good advanced planning. That she <laughs> and it's my staff. The British uh, gerontologist um, Tom Kirkwood, not Tom Kitwood, uh, for those of you that might know his work, uh, who did person-centered care, has said, the end of age, why everything about aging is changing. So I'm setting you this frame that the word is changing. And I don't like these words, successful and productive, which Sherry is pleased, because she said, if you're going to talk about that, are you going to criticize it? Because if you don't age successfully, uh, have enough cosmetic surgery so you look younger or whatever, you know, what does it mean? You, you're unproductive or you're unsuccessful? Um, we uh, did a conference a few years ago where I wrote an essay on just aging, meaning why do we have to put an adjective in front of this word? And shouldn't we be concerned also, in a kind of double entendre, about justice issues across the generations? And I'll end up, after I talk about the words uh, Alzheimer's and dementia, to share just a few stories of people with dementia who work in our intergenerational school that my wife and I founded, as Sherry mentioned. So this whole notion that aging should be a lifespan issue, should be an intergenerational issue, is part of what I think is important. This, in fact, is not a very good photograph of my wife, but we presented at something called the Positive Aging Conference. That goes on every year, and it's, it's the American way, not the Canadian way, to um, just take care of problems by putting the word positive in front of it and uh, somehow expecting things will change dramatically. We, we invented positive psychology down there, too, as well. Um, so all these words have their problems, but here we are. I actually changed the title of our talk that my wife and I gave, with her permission, to Purposeful Aging. Because I think that's a, that's a lot about what aging is about. Uh, and Mr. Murray, I'm sorry to point at you, is an example of how you can age and continue to reinvent what your purpose in life. And look, we're all here because of the purposes that he had in life in founding this center. This is Mary Catherine Bateson. This is the daughter of Margaret Mead and Gregory Bateson, who wrote a book called, um, I have a senior moment here, Composing a Further Life, The Age of Active Wisdom. And you know what? She invented a whole new phase of human life called adulthood too. You know, it wasn't until 1909 we invented the whole idea of adolescence. Well, that was a mistake, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, but honestly, between, let's say, 60 and 75, you've got a period where you can, and, and people like Mr. Murray extend it into even beyond that, where you be, can be active and engaged in community. And so this whole notion that we're inventing a whole new stage of life, adulthood too. And I'm, I remember, I'm going to get to the adult dementia words in a minute, but we're framing our concerns about those words in this context of uh, inventing aging. Now, this is an interesting guy. Um, Live forever. Aubrey de Grey thinks he can defeat death. Is he nuts? That's the subtitle. <laughs> the author concluded he was. <laughs> so why am I showing you him a photograph? Because, because he is the one that thinks by the year 2100, he and others will live to be 5,000 years old. He's got a whole program of anti-aging medicine. How many of you have heard of that? You kind of just find the right combination of pills and vitamins and anti-inflammatory agents and vaccines and growth factors, and you too can reverse human aging in our lifetime. Well, I think this is a little nuts. Um, <laughs> seven billion might be a few too many people already. And uh, you know, he's just, um, he just has this fantasy that if we just apply science strongly enough, we can fix aging. And I once asked him, well, if we fix aging, are we going to fix Alzheimer's too? And he said, probably. And that's because I'm switching now to Alzheimer's. Now, this is, Alzheim this is the Alzheimer's story I want to tell you that I think is changing, and I think what you're doing here is, 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 is supporting that very much. I also think that our fantasies about the biology of Alzheimer's are just that. It is unclear whether 
the drugs that people are saying can cure Alzheimer's disease are in fact medications that are designed to cure forms of brain aging. You will read that the myth of Alzheimer's is that it is not normal aging. And obviously, when people get it at a younger age, that's not normal aging. But it is also equally clear that there are no diagnostic tests, there are no medical tests that can clearly separate out aging from Alzheimer's in the brain, aging in the brain from Alzheimer's in the brain, despite spending tens of billions of dollars on this topic. And we all know that as we age, there are changes in our brain. So the question always is, if you're going to cure Alzheimer's disease, what's left? What's, what is the underlying process of brain aging, of which is the, the background for um, these, these conditions? So Alzheimer's is said to be this. This is the standard view, right? It was Dr. Alzheimer in uh, 1906 who showed to an audience these plaques and these tangles and in the shrunken brain, and this became what you read in all the publicity, the most common cause of dementia. Alzheimer himself was not sure that what he saw in the brains of this young woman were, in fact, um, a, a different condition. Uh, interestingly, we've just recently learned that Augusta D probably, because uh, she was in her 50s, had a genetic mutation which contributed to her dementia, to her Alzheimer's. And in fact, it wasn't until 1910 when Alzheimer's boss used the word Alzheimer's disease for the first time that we had a disease. Alzheimer was not sure he described the separate process. But when uh, Dr. Kreplin in Munich wrote it in his textbook, well, you know, you can always believe what you see in medical textbooks. <laughs> that's, that they change so quickly, it's, it's a, but kidding aside, that's when it became a disease, when a doctor said, this is a separate disease. But as I said, Alzheimer himself, uh, and I'm not going to walk you through this because I'm trying to make up a little time here, said he wasn't sure whether it was different than other forms of uh, dementia or from aging itself. So this notion of whether Alzheimer's was a separate condition was an issue way back in the beginning when they first used the word. In fact, you know that the first Augusta Dieter, uh, the lady that I just showed the picture of, had both those plaques and tangles in her brain. So Dr. Alzheimer got the diagnosis right. Well, he invent that's a funny thing when you he, because when he made the diagnose when he made, when he showed the plaques and tangles there wasn't a disease to be called that. The second case of so-called Alzheimer's only had plaques. So this issue of which is the most important feature, again, started in the very beginning. So um, we got ourselves in trouble. And fortunately, it was, we, it was this young man, Danny George, who knew my daughters in uh, the same high school and uh, went on to Oxford to get his PhD in medical anthropology. And I'll show you some of his research later. And we wrote this book, The Myth of Alzheimer's, What You Aren't Being Told About Today's Most Dreaded Diagnosis. And I want to make it clear that um, I have been caring for people with cognitive problems for over 30 years. And so it's not that I'm, I think, I'm not informed. Uh, by, and, and by the way, all the pictures are used with permission, as I'm sure you would, would, would imagine. I mean, this is a professor of biochemistry at my own university. And Danny um, is not a clinician, but he's worked with lots and lots of groups of uh, patients um, that are, uh, in this case, in our intergenerational school. By the way, am I pacing far too much for the camera? No? OK. All right. <laughs> And uh, if you don't want to buy the book, there's a website where we actively blog. And you can, you know, if you want to hear a bit more about the updates on the myth of Alzheimer's, here it is. Now, what do I mean uh, by this? Well, first, Cherry uh, said I was, an, I, was a, I was a good guy. You should listen to me. But here's Margaret Locke. I'm going to show a few of my favorite uh, famous Canadian friends. Margaret Locke is a Molson professor at McGill in anthropology. She is the most famous anthropologist of the female persuasion, and perhaps of any persuasion, uh, since Margaret Mead. Her book is coming out, and I commend it to you, The Alzheimer Conundrum, Entanglements of Dementia and Aging. And uh, she interviewed lots and lots of opinion leaders around the world about Alzheimer's and about my book. So there were a few that thought I'd lost my marbles. There are a few that didn't have time to read the book, including, by the way, a number of people that criticized it, because if you write a book called The Myth of Alzheimer's, you're going to get yourself in trouble. 
uh, even if the book's perfectly reasonable. But what was nice about this is um, there is a certain sense that the field needs shaking up. And, and, and that was what some of my friends were kind enough to say. Uh, they weren't kind enough to say that in public sometimes, but that's all right. <laughs> Why do I say that Alzheimer's is a myth? Because Alzheimer's uh, disease is not one thing in my opinion and in the opinion of many other people. And in fact, if you talk to a few people here, you'll find that Alzheimer's, so-called, affects people in very different ways. They uh, have a different onset. They have a different progression. Uh, they uh, have a whole series of differences. At the genetic level, there are 300 or so different mutations that can cause Alzheimer's uh, in the early onset forms. The brains don't look the same. Uh, the, the neurotransmitters are different, and it's become increasingly clear that Alzheimer's overlaps with other dementias. I have to leave here a little early because I finally got an appointment with Sandy uh, Black, who is the new director of the Toronto Dementia Research Alliance. And uh, she, uh, she couldn't meet any later, so I have a 2 o'clock appointment back in Toronto, which is my way of apologizing. That's assuming you're not throwing me out of the room and getting me on my way anyway. Uh, she gave a talk on Friday um, where she described the very intimate connections between Alzheimer's and vascular dementia, so-called stroke-related dementia. So it's really the case that it's increasingly difficult, even for the best neurologists in the world, and we have, you have some here in Canada, to make a clear distinction between those two, uh, those two conditions. So overlap occurs. And I've already mentioned my main point, that Alzheimer's overlaps with aging. Do you know that 30 to 40 percent of people who are older may have plaques and tangles and not any significant memory problem? And I'll explain that a bit more. So if you're older, you may have the plaques and tangles and not have a memory problem. But as you get older, the chance of having a memory problem goes up and up and up. So we don't know for sure if everybody lived to 120 whether everybody wouldn't have significant memory problems. So that relationship between the, is that me? <laughs> I'm distracting myself. I'm, I'm, I, I can't talk just standing still. OK. I'm not sure. OK, so, um, so here's the, the uh, I don't know if, if it's not distracting you, I can deal with it. But I'm just very concerned that it might be quite annoying to the audience. But uh, let me just try to be still. Um, so what uh, the myth is, uh, is that Alzheimer's is not a single thing, in my opinion. It's not, it's not quantitatively, uh, qualitatively different. It, it relates to aging on a continuum. Therefore, I think it is not likely to be fixed by a pill uh, in, in the sense of a cure. And I think there's an awful lot of unbridled faith in both science and the almighty dollar, that if we just spend enough money, somebody's going to get a Nobel Prize and make a lot of money by curing Alzheimer's. I think that is, um, unfortunately, a pressure. So we need different approaches, which is what I'm going to talk to you about in just a minute. Lest you think I'm the only one that thinks the language has to change, here is the international group that published new diagnostic criteria for Alzheimer's. And they said, revising the definition of Alzheimer's, a new lexicon. There was some new science, but basically they were shuffling words around. And the new science has to do with biomarkers. Does anybody know what a biomarker is? It's a spinal fluid test or a brain imaging test that is supposed to diagnose Alzheimer's disease with certainty. Unfortunately, they don't exist, even though, as we speak, People down uh, in the United States are trying to get our medical authorities to pay for an amyloid imaging device. Here is an interesting one, defining the preclinical stages of Alzheimer's disease, recommendations from our National Institute of Health and the Alzheimer's Association. You know what another word for preclinical Alzheimer's disease is? Asymptomatic Alzheimer's. Well, 
Maybe we all have asymptomatic Alzheimer's in the sense that we would all develop some of these changes as we get older. But clearly, if you don't have any symptoms, the way you make the diagnosis is with a medical test, a biomarker which, as I said, are not yet proven to be useful. So they're pushing the boundaries. How many of you have heard of mild cognitive impairment? Right. So you've got asymptomatic Alzheimer's. You've got early mild cognitive impairment. You've got late mild cognitive impairment. You've got very late mild cognitive impairment. You've got early Alzheimer's. You've got, in other words, we've got a continuum here that we're just labeling in different ways. <coughs> Uh, this is the uh, killer one, if you will. Uh, this, these are the new neuropathology criteria in which in the draft report they said that the pathology was disengaged. How many of you have heard this statement that the only way to be sure you can tell whether somebody's got Alzheimer's is to look at the brain? Then that's why m people have donated their brains. That all, definite Alzheimer's is only a patho pathological diagnosis? Some of you, I'm sure, have. This is where you like look at the audience and you figure, are they with you or they aren't with you? Depending, <laughs> either they're either nodding off or, uh, OK. Yeah, well, it's commonly said. Well, the problem is, as I said a minute ago, people with, uh, who are older may have plaques and tangles but not have a significant dementia. So you, you can have Alzheimer's disease clinically and you can have Alzheimer's disease pathologically, but they don't always connect. All I'm saying is that the science and the leading scientists are changing the story of Alzheimer's. This is, this is not one, you know, one person's view. This is a consensus uh, from several different groups. Um, Vladimir Herchinsky, another of my um, famous um, uh, Canadian uh, friends, is the uh, chairman of neurology at um, London, uh, uh, but he's also the head of the World Federation of Neurology. We wrote an article on dementia, okay, the changing views of dementia. Now, dementia is going away. Do you know how dementia is going away? Because the psychiatrists of the United States are saying it's going away. <laughs> you know, they cured homosexuality in 1973 when they decided it wasn't a disease. Now they're going to rename dementia as major neurocognitive disorder. And guess what? There is a minor neurocognitive <laughs> disorder. And the latest advance will be there's a very minor. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm glad you're laughing, but these are serious matters because these are labels that dramatically affect people's lives. So this is our, our critique of the SM5. This is an article we did on the Japanese public health campaign to change the word for dementia. Japan has a lot of older people, and their word chiho essentially meant the same thing as our English word dementia. It's a negative word. It meant disease of cognition associated with idiocy, not something we want to label people with. Well, the Japanese government developed a website and a rather open process, a little unique for the Japanese government, and they came up with a new word called ninshisho. So ninshisho is the Japanese word for what was dementia. It means cognitive condition or cognitive syndrome. So it was a softer word. So that was a recognition in the entire country of Japan that the words are powerful and perhaps need to change. And perhaps, you know, maybe the, the, the Japanese and the psychiatrists are in the same direction, but I think we, we, we would not want to think that all you have to do is change a word in order to address stigma. This is not the whole answer. Maybe it's part of it. So uh, to uh, bring you to the part of the talk where I am going to offer you my sense of what we, how we need to destigmatize or look at the issue of dementia in our society and develop new approaches, let me just show you this slide, which says, yes, our genes are important, but so are words and stories. And maybe we have to bring back this focus on people and their relationships. So what my wife and uh, I and lots of other people did was develop an intergenerational school in Cleveland, Ohio. And as part of that, we see um, we've created a Healthy Brains, Healthy Communities initiative where we're trying to bring the leaders in education and health together. This is uh, a graduate of my medical school, Case Western Reserve University, the first African-American Surgeon General and uh, head of the CDC in uh, the United States. Um, and so he launched this initiative. 
I think it's, uh, anybody here, here a cardiac arrhythmia? <laughs> What I'm going to suggest is that we take this one off. I, the acoustics in this room are really, really good. Okay. Oh, you, you in this room have to hear me without a microphone, which probably is going to be okay. Do you want to just remove that from your bottom? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's this one. I need to. We're going to turn this off. <laughs> I was once giving a lecture and there was a bomb scare, so just I, I can handle anything. I also have a collection of these that I tend to walk home with. So. All right, now I have to speak up because you don't have the microphone in this room. So the Intergenerational School uh, is located in Cleveland. Again, I'll move a little quickly through this. It's a place, it's a public school, a state-supported school, where we celebrate lifelong learning and spirited citizenship. So you'll hear us talk about people engaging in their community. And of course, it's a lifespan perspective. Uh, this is one of several of my patients, a young woman with dementia who's volunteered. It's a free school. It's been open for 13 years. It is the highest performing school of its type in our state. And that's because my wife is the principal. <laughs> and because we have small classrooms. And because older people engage in the lives of children, including people who have dementia. I mean, major neurocognitive disorder. <laughs> there's a lot of relationship building. There's a lot of community partnerships. I think the spirit of our school is very similar to what I feel about the spirit around here. Uh, dance, uh, computers. Um, the signature program is our reading mentoring program. And it's all about building relationships. This is Dr. Miller, who is the first female PhD in medical history, never had her own children but essentially uh, developed quite a few grandchildren uh, at our school by proxy, if you, well not by proxy, but by, by this uh, program we have. Um, Danny George, that young man who um, I wanted to set up with my daughters but couldn't, uh, the great guy, uh, uh, is, um, did a randomized control study where people with dementia who came from a, a nursing home nearby would come to the school by bus and volunteer and work with kids, or they would be randomly assigned to stay at their own long-term care facility and have a peer group interaction. And um, the intervention was storytelling, largely around objects and around books. And all of these people have mild to moderate dementia. And uh, I won't go through all the measurements that we use quantitatively, but the stress level and the cognitive functioning in, uh, but particularly the stress level, was reduced in the group that came and had that happy time with the children. So th this was some objective evidence that, uh, and it was a small study, there were only about nine in each group, so please don't overinterpret this. But I think if you look at the next slide, you'll see the qualitative data, which are all the stories people told about how the experience with the children benefited them. And so you can see here that the, the themes we heard from the stories about the participation in the school was youthful energy, cognitive stimulation, reduced uh, stress, that uh, they could continue their role as grandparents, that they themselves could share stories they hadn't thought about for a long time. There was joy. They were proxy grandchildren. A lot of our children are African American, and a lot of our elders uh, are, were not. So there was this notion of um, racial reconciliation. Uh, so relationships uh, and quality of life were a big uh, uh, part of the stories that un un unfolded from this. Now what we're doing is we're starting with this elementary school. It's a public school here. We're building um, the intergenerational programs, disseminating these through a variety of training programs to create what we believe are intergenerational learning communities. So this is the notion of having the school at a center of a revolution in uh, how we think about the relationship between adults and uh, uh, kids and elders. And just think about it for a minute. That's pretty fundamental to family. But because of urbanization, because of changes in the workforce, people don't have as much opportunity to be with their own grandchildren. So this is a program to foster that kind of relationship uh, to the benefit of both parties, the, the, the elders and the, and the children. One of the things um, is we study our watershed. This is the Doan Brook. We are in an urban area, and for various reasons, there is this protected brook that's a walking distance from our school. <laughs> Here we have Case Western Reserve University undergraduates teaching our kids about water quality. 
Here is our nature center where uh, the, uh, the kids and go with their elders uh, to, um, to learn about uh, how to observe nature and uh, look at patterns and, and get a sense of the, the, um, the, the joy of, uh, of learning. Um, we have been promoting this whole notion of creating healthier environments because I personally believe that there are huge environmental threats to healthy aging. And this is a report that we were part of with a closer look at Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And in New York, just in this past uh, May, we had a conference where we brought together people that were concerned about the health of children with the health of elders and uh, with the health of our environment. Because to, in, 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 we've got to bring these social forces together so we do create, I saw out, out in the table, age-friendly communities. Age-friendly communities that will be friendlier for kids, for adults, for people with dementia, for the environment. Uh, lead poisoning is a big issue still in Cleveland and many cities uh, because on that, it, no amount of lead, as you may know, is good for a child's brain. And in fact, uh, you could argue that lead poisoning causes late life dementia because it gives you a damage to your brain early on uh, that when you get older, it kind of catches up to you even more. Although, of course, lead poisoning can affect school performance even in a youngster. A few more uh, stories. This is Kay Fuller, who has a dementia. Uh, Kay Fuller was an environmental activist in the 1960s who prevented a corrupt politician from putting a freeway right through that nature center that I showed you the kids and the adults working. And um, uh, so our kids are in the uh, uh, room of, uh, of a long-term care facility that we work with interviewing Mrs. Barbara about how she saved the nature center with her friends uh, uh, in the 1960s. Uh, she has a dementia, as I said. Uh, this is the book that we self-published on the legacy of the Clark Freeway Fighters, something which I think is really important for all of us, particularly as we get older, which is how do we leave a sense of legacy? And what better way, from my perspective, of sh leaving a legacy is to be working with kids to share with them uh, this common sense across the generations of responsibility for the environment. And here is um, Mrs. Barber and uh, uh, sorry, Mrs. Fuller and Mrs. Barber uh, showing uh, their uh, pictures in their books to, to kids in our school. And we've published a lot of this stuff. This is a, an article on Mrs. Fuller that we called Occupy Nature. Uh, this was during the time of the Occupy movement, passing activism across generations. We don't, we believe in the arts and music uh, intergenerationally. And this is our uh, full-time music teacher, Samantha Muse, uh, Meese, who is a uh, vocal performer, and uh, I, you know, was talking to um, Sherry, uh, you know, music, um, all, f when, before you have dementia, you enjoy music, right? Most, many people enjoy music. All of a sudden, when you get dementia, it's music therapy. Uh, <laughs> why can't we just recognize that it's music and uh, dance? I think, I think dance is one of the greatest forms, because it includes that physical, but we actually, made a public health intervention. We did a concert attended by 1,200 people in Severance Hall where our symphony plays, and this is my friend Bob Cohen who's the composer. And the, feat, the story was Alzheimer's stories. It was a choral work that was designed to expand people's thinking about uh, Alzheimer's, to think about it differently. So this was a concert that was a public health intervention to use different ways of thinking about, um, about Alzheimer's disease. It was in Cleveland, absolutely. That's our very famous uh, Cleveland um, Severance Hall, which I wouldn't, and that was the, that's where our, our famous Cleveland Symphony plays. So we've got to think about this brain health concept that Sherry mentioned differently. We've got to focus on taking it to what I call a deeper and broader level. You know, I can tell you all about computer programs to keep your brain fit. I can talk about diet. I should be talking about it more myself. I can talk about physical exercise, but ultimately why we want to stay alive. What is the purpose that we have in life? That is the depth of brain health. You know, you can do all the wonderful things to stay healthy you want, but if you're not got a clear purpose and reason for being around, well, why do all that stuff? And the other thing is the breadth, and that is what is so great about this community. Uh, that, because honestly, most peop many people will discover that as you get older, the people around you are even more important to you. They're even more important to your sense of purpose and your sense of legacy. So taking this sense that brain health is not an individual activity, it's a team sport.
and it's really a community uh, 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 effort. I'm going to end up with another of my favorite um, um, people with dementia, if I can use that label. This is Arne Ness. Arne Ness was a Norwegian philosopher who uh, was the youngest professor of philosophy uh, ever at the University of Oslo. He then retired from academics and became an activist working with Greenpeace and other, other organizations for about 40 years after he retired as a professor. Um, but he's much loved in, um, in, in Norway. Um, uh, Norway has a lot of mountains, and Arne Ness had a hut where he used to go study on top of a mountain, small mountain in Norway. So Arne Ness uh, invented this metaphor. Remember, we've been talking about language here. We've been talking about creativity and imagination. And Arne Ness um, uh, suggested we as human beings need to think about things metaphorically like a mountain. We have to think broad-based, aspiring, sustainable, whatever you think a mountain communicates to you. And uh, so I'm just going to end with um, uh, two pictures of mountains and a kind of theme to my talk. Um, uh, in November of 2009, I got to do one of my um, bucket lists. I, I gave a talk in Kathmandu and then went trekking in, in the Him Himalayas. And in that talk, I invented a, uh, a word with some colleagues called intergenerativity. Have any of you heard of the word intergenerativity? No, because if you Google it, uh, you might see our paper. Uh, you know, words come and go. And uh, do you know what the English language word, I have more than five minutes, I can tell you this. You know there's a group in, in the United States, I don't know if it has international representation, it probably does, that looks at words uh, that come into our language in a new form. Um, when we had that famous um, kind of election uh, and the chads in the, um, in the, in the ballots got, uh, got uh, to be a problem, that was the word that year. In uh, 2000, uh, they picked the word of the millennium. The English word that was invented in the last thousand years that, that uh, had had the most impact on society. Anybody want to guess what that word was? No, I'm sure you do, but we don't have time. <laughs> she. Oh. She, the, according to these experts on, on linguistics, the, the, the feminine pronoun was an invention after the male pronoun. And that, they think, had some influence on human culture to have a pronoun to refer to separately women. But anyway, I'm a little off target. Um, <laughs> words and the stories that they, that, they, that they create through metaphor are really, really uh, important uh, for us to think about. And so intergenerativity is this word that is a blend of innovation and integration. It's taking sources of generativity in society and put them together. So we at an elder and a child, be it a nurse and a doctor, uh, be it a neuroscientist and an ethicist. So I think we have a challenge to our future. The challenges of Alzheimer's disease are embedded in the challenges of aging, are embedded in the challenges of what's happening to our planet. So I think if we can think about Alzheimer's disease in different ways, it really is much more important than doing that just for the people that have that condition. It will tell us things about our own minds, our own brains, our own aging, our own sense of what a community is, and our own sense of humanity. So I do believe that these words that we've talked about today are really important to think about. And um, I would recommend doing some of that thinking on a mountain in Nepal or anywhere else. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. So we'll take a few uh, questions before we move to our next uh, speaker. So if anyone has a pressing question that they'd like to ask Dr. Whitehouse, if you could just put your hand up. Yes. Can I just repeat the question for the people in the other room? So at the intergenerational school, how are the children taught about dementia? It's an interesting question that I really haven't um, uh, been asked before. And, and I, um, 
there, there, there are some formal um, orientations towards aging and the you know hearing and uh, ambulation and safety and uh, so there is a process of um, teaching in each classroom them about a cognitive aging and aging. I've never attended one of those sessions, so I can't tell you actually what they do, believe it or not. I certainly don't give them uh, lectures like this. However, the answer that came to my mind is they live with them. They go to school with them. They visit them. Every class goes to long-term care facilities. So I think um, they learn about um, dementia by experiencing um, older people and then learning that there's something called uh, you know, I, the other thing that, okay, so that's one thing I'll say, it's experiential. The other thing is, I will say, is we might co not completely have done our job because it's not like we actually ask the children, well, now that you've met a few of these people, what do you think of this word dementia? Because I think there's an openness to experiencing older adults that exists in the space that the label is not necessary for. So if I've given you a, a somewhat incoherent and complicated answer, it's because I'm not sure, um, but I, I'm going to have to ask my wife a bit more about what they actually do in the classroom. <laughs> I know that when we're together working on projects, we're not talking about what people's labels are, we're just experiencing them as people. And I think that's probably the best part of my answer. Peter, there's a question from the other room. Hello there. Are there any lessons we can learn about alternative approaches to understandings of aging from other cultural groups who use non-Western models of health and wellness that you know of? Um, I made uh, some reference to uh, Japan and actually to um, Asian ways of, of thinking. Um, and of course, when you say that, I mean, there are um, so many different kinds of Asian countries and within each of those countries enormously complex cultural variations. So let me just say that there's a, a certain um, um, modesty that one has to have with characterizing uh, the East as the East and the West as the West and so on. Uh, I think that um, we in the West, because of the Western Enlightenment, like to label things. I mean, we've organized knowledge into categories and boxes and academic silos. And I think there's an openness to um, going in between. That intergenerativity word that I used is a, almost more of an Eastern word. Uh, I, I think the, the, the Asian cultures attend more to process and certainly to relationships. I mean, they say in Japan and in China that in the individual sense of selfhood, autonomy, the Canadian American, we are our own individual people, it's different there. There's a sense of the communal sense of self, that you are the self only in relationship to other people. So actually, I think there are some lessons from the East that we could take in our own Western cultures, because we all have these concepts. It's just a question of what is, what, is, um, what, is, what is best for the time. I mean, I think the United States needs not just a declaration of independence. This is a political comment. OK, forget that. We need a declaration of interdependence, you know, uh, of how we work uh, well together. Other questions? Yes, I have a question. What is your view on Dr. Murray Newport's research? Dr. Murray Newport, uh, can you tell me a little bit more about Dr. Newport's research? I may recognize it if you tell me, but uh, I don't know the name right off the bat. Oh, yes. Well, we just happened to see in a, in a paper, and we went on internet, and it showed up that she was uh, healing her Alzheimer's uh, husband with uh, coconut oil. Oh, right. Yes. <laughs> if you had said coconut oil, I think I might have. <laughs> yeah. That was it. First, is she putting it on the skin, or is she uh, consuming it? I mean, um, I, you know, I think if I had it, I don't know the person. I, I, I am a b big believer in trying to avoid uh, strong medical therapies if you can. So I'm all in. I, I believe in natural ways of thinking about healing. However. There are lots of people who have um, discovered things in their own lives that um, work for them, which is good, and particularly if they're safe, 
but they don't really have enough evidence to be sure that other people, it will benefit other people. Uh, so I have to withhold judgment about, about that. Um, I, I want to tell one more story because it relates to that. We are going tomorrow uh, to the Legacy Project, which is uh, north of Toronto. Some of you may have heard about it. They're all about creating intergenerational communities. And they uh, have as a member of their team uh, the principal uh, leader, Susan Bozak's mother, Nadia, who has dementia. So on tomorrow, I'll be working with a team. Um, and they um, have their facility out in an arboretum. And in that uh, facility, they go out and they uh, interact with the trees. I don't think they have any coconut trees. Uh, <laughs> but the whole notion that you can heal and connect by feeling that connection to, to nature and to trees uh, and I also share that story because it's also another person with dementia who's contributing significantly to, um, to that project. One more question. Well, I, I just want to say thank you very much. This is such a wonderful community. And, um, and I look forward to coming back and visiting and seeing some of your good work on a future occasion. Great. Well, thank you. us here at the Murray Alzheimer Research and Education Program, just a small token of our appreciation for you coming. We're thrilled to have you here. And I get to, to be with Peter tomorrow at the Legacy Project um, meeting as well. So that right. will be fun to see what they're doing in Toronto. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.